fails again. They, John and Debbie gave me a, a, a fail safe. Uh, they also gave me this. And it, when, when, my poc, when my keys go to my socks, they can snap right back up. So we're good to go with that. So thanks, guys. That was wonderful. Well, uh, last week we saw uh, that Jesus speaks with authority. Remember, and we, we looked at the passage on how Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth and he unrolls the scroll to Isaiah in Isaiah and he reads it and he says, this passage has now been fulfilled in your hearing and explains what that means and it's awesome and we learned how Jesus speaks with authority. Today, we're going to see that not only Jesus speaks with authority, but Jesus has authority. Today, the title of the message is The Demon Who Came to Church. The Demon Who Came to Church. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 37. Jesus not only is all talk, but he has authority. So if you're new to Arlington Assembly, what we do is we take the Bible verse by verse and we make our way through it. And right now we're studying the book of Luke and we're going through that right now. And, and uh, we, we make periodic breaks uh, to do other series and other standalone messages, but we just keep coming back to Luke. And today we find ourselves in a very interesting, interesting passage. We're going we're gonna to see this as we go through Luke. There's lots of interesting passages that we're going to be in Luke. And uh, this is a passage about a demon who came to church. About a demon who came to church. It may surprise you to know the devil does go to churches. He's very interested in what happens in a church. I think I sat next to him once. Ninety <laughs> percent sure. <laughs> but there is an enemy. The devil who hates God and is fighting against God, he's trying to thwart the plans and the purposes of God. And the Bible is very clear that there are demons. So one of the interesting things about going through a book of the Bible verse by verse is it, it takes you out of your comfort zone. And it's going to take you into passages maybe you wouldn't normally uh, go, you know, go to. This wouldn't be a go-to passage of mine. But since we're going through it verse by verse, we're going to address it squarely, Right? So uh, the Bible is clear that there are demons. So we're going to talk about uh, demons, demonic activity in our world today. What does we as believers do with that? What was happening in this passage and what we learned from that? Uh, so let's start out with the most obvious question. And, and I'll just give you a little bit of an overview now. And then, and then we're going to pray. And then I'll do a little bit more of an interview, uh, overview. I actually cut half of this message uh, for time's sake. So um, one of these days, you'll get a full message. That happens every week. Um, you're like, they're already long. Yeah, that's half. That's half of it. So, uh, um, so I'm going to try to get as many details in there as possible that are pertinent, that would be helpful uh, to you. But let's start with the most obvious question, and that is, well, where did the devil and demons come from, Right? Where did the devil and demons come from? Let's, let's start there. Well, God in eternity past... He existed all by himself. And God created, let me do this side. Here's God. And he created everything that is. He created the visible world and the invisible world from our perspective. There are only two categories. Everything that exists fits into two categories. God and everything that he created, right? And part of his creation, he created spiritual beings that would serve him and carry out his will. And generically speaking, we call them angels. Among the angelic beings, there was one being created who was really in many respects greater than the other angelic beings. His name was Lucifer. He was called the son of the morning. There is a hierarchy of angelic beings with varying ranks and powers, seraphims, cherubims, archangels, angels, and Lucifer sat at the top. He had the most access to the throne of God. The Bible tells us that he was the highest of all of God's creation prior to the creation of mankind. Lucifer at some point became prideful and thought that he should run the show and he should be the one who sat on the throne and ruled everything. And he aspired to take God's place and he led a rebellion, taking one third of the angels in rebellion with him against God. And they were cast out of heaven. And through pride and rebellion, they became utterly evil. And those angelic beings cast out, we know them as demons. 
They just retitled them demons uh, for clarification. And they were designed to carry out God's will, but now they work to circumvent and to thwart the will of God. So now there are two-thirds angels, one-third uh, fallen angels, however many there are. We know there's lots of them, but demons are eternal creatures. They cannot be redeemed. They cannot be forgiven, and they will not repent. Uh, they are forever wicked. And demons operate in a world today to oppose God and to achieve Satan's purposes. They are real. They are personal. That means they have personality. They have individuality. They, and they are wicked. 1 John 5.19 says this, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. Satan blinds people to spiritual truth. Satan blinds people to spiritual reality. So when we look at the world and we look around us and we see all of the evil, what we are seeing is not only the result of human sinfulness, but what we are seeing is the result of a complex system of wickedness that is being pervaded by millions of demons, if not more. Demons are real and they would rather that you didn't believe in their existence. They do not want to be known. Demons are, uh, you know, they, they would rather you think of demons and the concept of demons as something as a relic of a superstitious past, right? Demons are nothing more than comical figures, cartoonish, right? Pitchfork and red tights, right? Something to laugh at, a, a figment of man's imagination. And, 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 I, uh, and their policy is to conceal themselves and to keep people in the dark about demonic activity. And I think that's very ingenious, I think that's very uh, deceptive. If I was a demon and I wanted to take down as many people as I can, I think that's a pretty good strategy. And that is one of their strategies to hide in the darkness and to conceal themselves. And um, they, they don't want to be discovered. Demons would rather function in a secret, subtle way so that they continue, so that they can continue to operate in their deception, right? But when demons are confronted with the presence of the living God, they will manifest themselves, and that's what's happening in Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 37. So let's open it with a word of prayer, and we're going to work through this passage, and we have lots more to talk about that, and I'll give you some more details uh, of an overview of demons and all of that. Father, we come before you this morning as we address a topic we don't normally talk about, Lord, there's lots of questions, curiosity, um, maybe even some um, out-of-bounds curiosity with people in this place. Lord, we pray that your presence would speak to us, help us to learn what, we, what you want us to draw from this passage today, help us as believers to be on our guard, and... Um, and to be people of prayer. And um, Lord, I just pray you would have, the, have your way. Lord, there's, there's, there's so many things popping in my mind to pray right now, but Lord, you know what those are. I, I just offer them up to you. Now, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And uh, now, Lord, may your word, these scriptures, this passage, fall on the good soil of our hearts. And may it take deep root and may it grow strong and tall and bear much fruit for your glory to build your kingdom and to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So let's read the passage and, and then we'll talk through it. Starting at verse 31. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because he spoke with authority. We looked at that last week. Verse 33, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring 
the man that was possessed. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, this is all happening in a church service in the synagogue, what is this teaching? What with authority and power Jesus gives orders and even evil spirits obey him and they flee at his command. And the news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. So here in Luke chapter four, this is the first mention of the demonic in the book of Luke. And Luke will mention demons 23 times in the gospel of Luke. So if I don't fit all the details about demons in, we got 22 other places, right? So, but casting out demons is a part of Jesus's gospel ministry. We see it happen quite often. And it is setting the captive free. It is setting the captive free. Now, what are demons? What are demons? Let me, let me, and what do they do? Let me, let me explain a little bit more because we don't talk about this often, okay? Demons are fallen angels. Demons are fallen angels. And this is very, very important to understand in your theology that God did not create the devil, God did not create demons. God did not create evil. Okay? This is very, very important to lock down in your theology, right? Those did not come, the devil, demons, uh, evil did not come from God. Evil angels were once holy angels whom God created, created as holy, they, and they are not an independent force opposed to God. It's not God has always existed and evil has always existed, and they're battling, and who's going to eventually win? We think it's going to be good that overcomes evil, and they're, and they're just some independent force opposing God. No, they were created as holy angels angels, their existence comes from God as holy, but then they rebelled against him. Okay, that's very important for the baseline of your theology. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says that God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them out. Jude verse 6 gives some more details on that, and I'm going to throw out a lot of references to you, so I encourage you to go back and write these down and look them up and, and read those, but the angels who sin came under God's judgment. And let me say this as well. Remember that there are only two categories, God and everything that he created, right? So the devil and the demons and even angels themselves, seraphim, seraphim, they are not even in the same category as the living God. They are created beings. Though they're stronger than us, more intelligent than us, uh, uh, you know, in the created order uh, in these bodies, uh, but um, they are created. And so there, it's not like God versus the devil, who's going to win, right? And it's close, right? God, gets, God lost that round, devil lost that round. It could go either way in this, right? Losing battles, but who's going to eventually, God will probably win the war because he's God, but there's battle, you know? No, 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 it's not, it's not like that at all. It's, it's the devil was cast out of heaven. It was, <laughs> you're an angel, you're a created being. I think I should, I don't think so. In, in fact, in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's pretty quick. I don't think so. Oh, no. Back slap. But demons are angels that were created by God who were originally good, but they sinned and thus became evil. So that's important for your baseline theology. When this rebellion took place, we don't know, but it probably occurred between the time when God completed creation and pronounced everything as very good and the temptation and fall of man. I have some really juicy theories, I think, are scripturally sound, but I'm not going to be up here preaching my theories. If you want to know afterwards, I'll tell you a good, good theory I got on, on that. Uh, but let's stick to the text. <laughs> the devil engages in opposing God and the work of Christ. He does this especially by tempting man, who is the only mankind, human beings, who are the only thing in God's creation made in his image and thus redeemable. One of the primary means used by Satan is deception. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 through 15 tells us that Satan disguises himself, masquerades as an angel of light, 
and that his servants disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. That, you know, they want to come across as a good guy, right? As the good guy. Oh, you know, you see the, you know, the angel playing the harp. That's boring, but I'm the good guy, right? I'm gonna, you're going to have fun and all this stuff and deception. And, and they would know how to disguise themselves as angels of light and righteousness. They would know how to do that because they once were. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, he, he opposes and hinders Christians in their service. Now, forever, for however much power Satan has, and it has to be quite a bit in order to, most of the world is under his deception, has blinded the, the unbelievers around the world, right? So it's gotta, there's got to be quite a bit of power there, but for however much power he does have, it is limited, he does not have unlimited power as God. He does not have unlimited knowledge as God. He is, he is not God. He is a created being. So, so however much power he has, and it's a lot, it is limited. And it is restrained by God. He cannot do everything that he wants to do. If he did, we'd all be dead. The devil and demons can be successfully resisted by believers. And they will flee. James chapter 4, verse 7, Ephesians 4, verse 27. But they can only be put to flight, not by our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. If you think you're going to go up against the devil or a demon, a fallen angel, on your own and win, you're kidding yourself. They have quite a bit of advantage. One, they've been dealing with humans since the beginning and got quite a bit of practice. Even if you're in your 70s, they got way more practice, thousands and thousands of years of dealing with humanity. You think you're a special, you know, in, in unique, and that wouldn't happen to me, or that, you know, I'm so... They've, they, they've got quite the advantage in, in knowledge, in, in strategy, and um, um, we cannot go against one-on-one, -on -one, but they can be resisted and overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you, if you haven't listened to the previous series we just did on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, do that. Because there's, there's power there to uh, all kinds of things. So um, we cast demons out. So as Satan's subjects, demons carry out his work in the world. They engage in all kinds of forms of temptation and deception, which he employs. Some of that is they inflict disease. Deafness and dumbness, Mark 9, 25. They caused blindness and deformity, Mark, Matthew 9 and Matthew 12, 22. Convulsions, Mark 1, 26, Mark 9, 20, Luke 9, 39. Paralysis or lameness in Acts 8, 7. Matthew 17, we see that they can cause mental problems. Insanity in Luke 8. Masochism in Mark 5. Suicide in Mark 9. And murder in Revelation 9. Incidents of demon possession are given prominent attention in the Bible, like this man in our passage. The technical expression is to have a demon. Sometimes they are referred to as unclean spirits or evil spirits. The manifestations of demon possession is varied. Uh, the person possessed may have unusual strength, Mark 5, 2 through 4. The person acts in extremely bizarre ways, Luke 8, 27, and they will have an extreme interest in either death, extreme sexual immorality, or demonic activity. They engage in self-destructive behavior, Matthew 17, 15, Mark 5, 5, and there are degrees of affliction. Matthew chapter 12, verse 45, Jesus spoke of evil spirits, uh, of an evil spirit who goes and brings with him seven other spirits more evil than himself. So I don't know if you've ever read that passage before. I was, I've had experience with that before. Um, uh, I've been a part of both watching demons get cast out and casting, being the person who prays and casts demons out. And uh, I was in church one time, in church. Here we are, I was in the synagogue, and uh, a man possessed, he was in his 20s. Um, uh, at first, he was very, I was, I was a teenager, and you could watch him, he, he became, as the service progressed, became more and more agitated. In fact, he couldn't sit still, and eventually he stood up, and a voice came out of him uh, without his mouth moving and, and started yelling profanities at God. I mean, this is during the service, and screaming out. The pastor 
anybody who's a prayer warrior, deacons, whatever, they, they, they run, gather around him. The dude gets thrown to the floor, not by the people, but the demon throws him on the ground. He's foaming at the mouth. You can hear demons coming, speaking out of him. They're, 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 he's not talking. He's, he, they're, they're coming. You can hear them. And they're saying things, and they're trying to say what their names are, and all that. They're trying to make people over curious. Instead of casting them out, they want to, you know, delve in conversation and, oh, what's your name and who are you? No, no, the pastor was very, very good at this. He said, don't listen to them. You just begin to pray, cast them out. And, and one came out, there's still more. Another one came out. Seven demons came out of this guy within about a 30 minute period. And he was a new man. He was changed. He stood up. He was in his right mind. It was, it was absolutely amazing. And while that was taking place, the pastor gave really good counsel. He said, if you're, you know, everybody here that's watching that's not praying, be praying, be prayed up because when these demons come out, they're looking for somewhere to go. So you better have your heart right with God, right? So I was, as a teenager, I was like, oh God, you know, I was like, woo, I got, I was all like, woo, revival broke out with my heart that day. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and really it was addressing unbelievers. If you're an unbeliever in this place, you better uh, make sure your heart is right with God because, you know, if uh, they could just go from one unchristian to another one. And, um, they're looking for a place, and so make sure your heart's right with God. And I would say if, if that ever happened at this church, I would give that same, same counsel. Now, in all, all of these cases, the common element is that the person involved is being destroyed. They're being destroyed physically. They're being destroyed emotionally. They're being destroyed relationally. They're being destroyed spiritually. And it appears that demons are able to speak out of the person who is possessed um, and, and either it's them, the demon talking, or to be able to control the person's vocal cords. And it's the person talking, but it's not them, it's the demon. Now, we're to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, right? And baptized with the Holy Spirit, right? And we pray, but the Holy Spirit uh, intercedes for us. And so it's kind of like the flip side of that. And so I, I was, uh, my wife and I were youth pastors. It was our first ministry position, and we were in Southern California, and it was about midnight, and we hear this, just this pounding. We live in the parsonage of the church, which is right next to the church, two car lengths away from the side entrance of the door. And we hear this pounding. It was coming from the church. Somebody was pounding on the church, like, like, just wailing on it. And so I was like, I gotta go see what's going on. And so I go outside and this dude is punching the church. He's spitting on the front door. He's, he's putting upside down crosses on the front door with his spit. And, and he's just saying all kinds of vile things. And I walk over to him. It's obvious this guy's demon possessed. He's, he's burning himself. He's trying to light himself on fire. He's burning his skin. There's no pain. He's, he's just um, uh, some, some, some of you are attracting because you, you've seen this before uh, uh, but he's burning himself and, 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 and cutting and, and um, so I began to address this man and he was possessed by an evil spirit and he began to he began to talk to me the evil spirit began to say things and uh, we had this interaction but then he would go in and out and all of a sudden, he would, he would be screaming profanities at God. And I'm going to come up there, and he'd say the most ungodly things. I mean, I had to use Q-tips afterwards. <laughs> things I've never heard, honestly. And then he would fall to the ground, and he'd just begin to weep and cry. And I knew it was him. And in those moments, I would go to him, and I, I would say, who are you? What's your name? You know, what's going on? And, you know, he's like, my wife left me and my kids this, and one of my kids passed away, and it's just devastation, and he's weeping, and he doesn't know what to do. He's a human being. And then he would just, ah, and he would be, the demon would take over and just begin to curse profanities and, 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 and was hurting, he was hurting himself with, with knives and, and things, and I, I had to be very, very careful. And, and probably after about, an, he went in and out, in and out, in and out, and, and after a while, after getting to the point, after about an hour, knowing that this, you know, this wasn't the, this, this wasn't working, I, I got really tired. It's now like one in the morning, and I'm like, okay, that's enough. That's enough. Okay, demon, you got to get out of here now. Like, that, that, that's it. And we just went. I, I tried to help the guy, and, and, and I was sharing the gospel with him when I could in those moments. 
uh, but that wasn't working, so I was like, okay. So we had to, and, and we literally pushed the demon all the way out of the neighborhood, walked him out of the neighborhood. That's a whole other story. You can, you can talk to me afterwards if you want about more specifics on that, but that's real. It was real, and uh, it was a little scary, to be honest, and, uh, but, but praise God for the power of his Holy Spirit. It appears that demons can also inhabit animals. They were cast into swine, Matthew 8, Mark 5, Luke 8. They were cast into swine. And, and I know that it can possess animals because uh, we, we had a cat once. <laughs> I kid you not, this cat was possessed. Like, no joke, no lie, no doubt. We treated it so nice. We're so kind to it. It was, little, it was the most... It was, he was possessed. It was so violent. It was such a mean cat. It was like, all right. I'm going to name him Legion. I'd also, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find where we are in our notes here. <laughs> totally off in the notes. I, I, I would like to note uh, that the Bible does not attribute all illness to demon possession. Just because somebody is sick and illness, uh, that, they, that that's because of that. No, it, it's not um, because of that. The book of Luke reports that Jesus distinguished between two types of healing. Luke 13, 32, Matthew 10, 8, Mark 1, 34, Mark 6, 13, Luke 4, 40 to 41, which we're going to be in next week because next week we're talking about divine healing. But all sickness isn't caused by demons. There are people who are sick just because they're sick, but there are people who are sick because of demons. So it's, it's not all sickness is because of demons, though sickness can be caused by demons is, all, is the point, okay? So please don't confuse that and, 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 um, and think just because someone's sick that they're, no, they're demon-possessed, no. Uh, in, in the scriptures, Jesus casts out demons without pronouncing an elaborate formula. He merely commanded them to come out, and they came out, and he attributed it to the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was our example. He, in fact, Jesus invested his disciples with authority to cast out demons, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. But they needed faith if they were going to be successful, Matthew 17, 19 through 20. He also says that uh, uh, prayer is mentioned as a requirement, and that is a person of prayer. So be a person of prayer. In fact, fasting is a requirement for certain ones. Mark chapter 9, verse 29, that, that certain ones can only, uh, the, the disciples try to cast out the demon and he would not, and Jesus says this, these only come out with prayer and fasting. So, don't know all the reasons why, but that's what is. Sometimes faith on the part of a third party was a requirement. Math, Mark chapter 9, verse 23 through 24, Mark 6, verse 5 through 6. At times, demons were expelled from someone who had expressed no wish to be healed. There is no biblical reason to believe that demon possessions are restricted to the past when Jesus was on earth. You don't have to look very far in our world today to see that demon possession is still occurring. The man in verse 33 in our passage is described as being possessed by a demon. When, when people talk about demonic activity, you know, in the life of people, you know, often, they do, often what they do is they use phrases like obsessed or oppressed or possessed uh, as if there were levels, but the Bible does not make those kinds of distinctions. The word is and simply means to be under control of demons. To be demonized is to be indwelt by a demon. So we're to be, we're indwelt as believers by the Holy Spirit. At the moment of salvation, when you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit comes in and takes residence in, in you. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, a person who is demonized is indwelt by a demon or demons. It is to be controlled it is to be tormented by an evil spirit. That's what it means. And demons can do all kinds of things. Let me just say this to you, too, in, in talking about demonic activity, and I think this is very important for your baseline um, foundation for your theology on the demonic, that demons cannot inhabit a Christian. That as a believer, you cannot be possessed by a demon as a believer. They cannot indwell a Christian. Why? Let me just throw it out there. Why couldn't, the, why couldn't a demon possess it? Uh, the Spirit of God is there, right? You got it. 
There's, there's been a lot of teaching starting in the 70s with a thought that Christians need to be delivered of demons. You will not find one instance in the Bible where a believer is demon-possessed or demonized. It doesn't happen. It's not there. It's, it, there's not one instant. There, there may be issues where a Christian has, through a pattern of ongoing disobedience, given the enemy a foothold in their life, and that may have even grown into a stronghold in their life, meaning uh, by giving the devil a foothold, it means that you've given the devil something to work with in their fight against you. You've given the enemy something to work with in their fight against you. He does fight believers. In fact, he fights even harder to believers who, aren't, uh, who are a threat. So if, the, if the, you're not getting attacked very hard from the enemy, well, maybe you're not a big threat. Sorry. <laughs> that's what is, though. I'm just saying, that's what is. Don't shoot the messenger. You know, it, it, you know but through a pattern of ongoing disobedience that believers give the enemy something to work with. They give the enemy a foothold. Ephesians 4.26 says, don't let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil a foothold. So this is talking to believers. To believers, don't give the devil a foothold. So if you're somebody who harbors bitterness, if you're somebody who harbors resentment, if you're a believer who, who holds on to offenses... Somebody offended you, and you, uh, you hold on to that. You cannot let that go. You refuse to let that go. Or you um, take up other people's offenses as your own. Oh, somebody hurt your friend, and I'm going to take that up, and I hold on to that. Uh, then you're giving the enemy an opportunity to work in your life. You're giving the enemy a foothold, according to this verse. But working in your life and controlling your life are two different things right? Attacking you and possessing you are two very different things. They're not the same things, right? So attack you, they can. So don't give them anything to work with and be a person of prayer, but they possess you, they cannot as a believer. First John 5, 18 through 20. Let me give you some more scriptures on this because I think this is important theology, baseline theology. Verse 18, we know that anyone born of God, that's someone who is a Christian, who is born again, does not continue to sin. We don't want to keep sinning, right? But Jesus Christ keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are the children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him. We're in Christ, right? So, Good there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul asks this in verse 17 and 18, how can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? So you can't have the Spirit of God living in you, the Holy Spirit, which is the true condition of every uh, true believer, and have the enemy and darkness living in you at the same time. It's impossible. It doesn't happen. It cannot happen. The Holy Spirit does not share the same space with demons, okay? They will never be roommates, all right? Demons flee God's presence. They flee God's presence. They don't want to be roommates with the Holy Spirit. They flee his presence. Those who teach that a Christian can be demonized do so in spite of the fact that the Bible does not acknowledge that as a reality and in fact says it cannot be a reality, so I would encourage you not to listen to that kind of teaching. But demons do attack people. They do attack believers. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Let's look at that. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That's one another. That's human beings. The battle is not against you and I, or you and you, or, or people out there, or even unbelievers. They're human beings. The battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other humans. But who is it against? For our struggle is against principalities, against the powers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in high places. They oppose the spiritual progress of God's people. Listen, the enemy will never give up territory without a fight. 
in your own life, in your own growth and discipleship, in your own walk with the Lord. God, I want to know you more. God, I want to be closer to you, right? That means I got to let this area go. That means I got to give you, the, you know, access to this a part of me, God, I got to work, let you work on this attitude in me, right? And as we progress in knowing Christ and becoming like him and drawing close to God, the enemy will not give up any territory without a fight. He will fight you on that. He will do everything that he can to keep you from praying, to keep you from being filled with the Holy Spirit, to keep you from in the word, to keep you from gathering with other believers, to be strengthened, to, to all kinds of things. Like he's, gonna, he's going to do his best to try to stop your growth. And uh, even in churches and worldwide, God is trying, the devil is not going to give up territory without a fight. He is not going to give up Arlington without a fight. And he has proven to do that. I, I mean, I, the, the, from my perspective as a pastor, as a bullseye, is if the enemy can harm me and take me out, he's going to do a lot of damage to the body. And from my perspective, the warfare over this church and this city has been next level, honestly, which tells me something. Not only do we have God's attention, but we have the enemy's attention. We're a threat. And God has made promises to this place that he's going to do in this place. I know that because he's told other people, he's told me, and he's given me snapshots of what he's going to do, so I know it's coming, and the enemy is trying to oppose that and do everything he can to throw monkey wrenches and to take people out and do whatever he can, so I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, church, hang in there, be people of prayer, and, and he's coming, God's coming, right? And he's gonna win, and we're gonna, we're gonna see God save the city. We're gonna see God save this city. But the enemy won't give it up without a fight, and so we're gonna fight, because it's worth fighting for, because they're people, right? Because they're us. They're us out there, right? And God loves them, and Christ Jesus died for them. And, and we're to go and tell them the good news. He's come to set the captive free. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded. For your adversary, the devil, Satan, like a roaring lion, is looking for subjects to devour. That's pretty strong, uh, uh, gruesome, detailed language, isn't it? Certainly demons are on the prowl. They are on the loose. And when an opportunity arises, they will attack God's people. They're looking for an opportunity, but they cannot possess you or control you. However, the same cannot be said for non-Christians. Just a scary thought. You know, though demons do not possess every non-Christian, please don't send me emails. I know, I know, we know. But demons do not possess every non-Christian. That is certainly a possibility in the life of a non-Christian, right? Demons are capable of doing all those kinds of things and more that we talked about at times. They do control people, and when they do, they torment those people, and that's what we read about here in Luke chapter 4. So let's go through our passage. We're already halfway through the message, so, so don't freak out like that was all intro. I should have pretended like that was all intro. Here we go to the message. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, don't leave and get up to go to the bathroom. People think you're agitated and maybe possessed. So <laughs> now you're stuck here. Now you're stuck here. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Long version. <laughs> Onward and upward. I'm joking. <laughs> Number one, two, two, two points. And the second point is like so quick. It's like one minute long. We'll spend most of our time here. Point number one, the authority of Jesus Christ. The authority of Jesus Christ, starting in verse 31. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. They went down because Capernaum from Nazareth is going down in elevation, about 2,000 feet in elevation. Capernaum was not a large town. It was a town of maybe about 5,000 people in that time in the time of Jesus. And it was the center for a fishing industry that provided fish around that part of the Roman Empire, had a very healthy economy. Um, uh, if you lived there, uh, housing would have been expensive. It was a very expensive place to live. There was a large measure of wealth that was attached to that place in Capernaum. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach 
the people. So here's Jesus. He goes into the synagogue. Last week, he went into the synagogue of Nazareth. Remember, he's just going into different synagogues, right? And he's teaching. So last week, he was in Nazareth, and we talked about what they would do in the synagogue. We kind of worked through the liturgy, you know, the order of service. They would sing a song, and then they would look, look, they'd go through all these things. And so uh, if, if you don't remember that, you can go back to last week's message and, and hear about all the different things that they do in the synagogue, still do uh, in most of them today. Uh, so Jesus goes into the synagogue at Capernaum. So we kind of kind of have an idea of what they're going to do. They're going to start out with a song, and then they're going right, to they're going to read from the Torah, and then they're going to they're going to do all the things, right? So that's happening. And it wouldn't be unusual for a well-known rabbi to be asked to give the sermon. So Jesus comes to Capernaum, he comes into the synagogue, and they ask him, Hey, will you give the sermon? Verse 32, they were amazed at his teaching. He gives a sermon. I wish I would have known what it is. I'd love to know that. They don't record it what it was, but he teaches, and they're amazed at his teaching. Why? Why are they amazed at his teaching? Because he spoke with authority. He was the greatest speaker who has ever lived. He would speak like no one they've ever heard. You remember in John chapter 8, when they go to arrest him, um, the, the temple guards, they come back and they, they haven't arrested him. And so the chief priests are like, hey, we sent you to go arrest him. You know, you come back. Where are they? How come you haven't arrested them? And they said, because we never heard anybody speak like this. And it says they were amazed. The temple guards go to arrest and they're sent to, and they hear him speak and they're like, no way. They just walk off. I ain't arresting that dude. No way, that was amazing. That was amazing. They were not only amazed at his ability to articulate truth and his command of scripture, but they were amazed by the fact that he spoke like every other rabbi they had ever heard in that he spoke with authority. And I want to explain what that means. And this is really Luke's issue. The whole issue is, Jesus' authority. They were amazed at his authority. So let me, let me explain what that is. So in Matthew chapter 21, one of the major issues is where did Jesus get the authority to do this, right? Because normally what would happen in the synagogue is a rabbi would come and he would start the sermon and he would give the sermon and he would say, okay, and he would read the passage of scripture and here's what the scripture says. And we know this is what the scripture says because rabbi so-and-so said this and rabbi so-and-so said that. And, and, and they would quote all these rabbinical teachings and traditions and Jesus did none of that. In fact, Jesus might be just as likely to take a rabbinical interpretation and turn it on its head, and it infuriated them. I mean, in Matthew chapter 21, the elders of the people came to him and said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Who says you could just say it, and that's how it is, is what they're saying. You just say, this is how it is, and that's how it is. Who, who gave you that authority? A very typical sample of Jesus' preaching, Jesus uh, not only would say, this is what it means, but he also says, you know what? You've been taught a lot of tradition that doesn't line up with the word of God. And then he goes in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 21, and I'm, I'm just going to give you a few because there's a ton of them in here, but you have heard it that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder and then he says, but I tell you. Verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, right? And what Jesus is doing is he's quoting rabbinic tradition that has twisted the scripture, and Jesus is putting it in its proper interpretation. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I tell you right? And he goes through this, taking on Jewish tradition, not quoting any of the rabbis. And at the end of the sermon, it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because they never heard anybody talk like this. Verse 28, because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. He spoke clearly and articulated correct positions on theology, and he did it without quoting rabbinic tradition, absolutely unheard of. Now, as we come back to Luke, they're amazed at his teaching, they're amazed at the authority in which he speaks, but in their back of their minds is, is does he have the right to do that? Because that's always their question. And that question is now going to be answered. 
right? Jesus has the authority. He, he, he has the authority to speak, and it is so. How Jesus says it, that's how things really are. How do we know? Jesus has authority over demons. That's how we know. Does he have authority? Absolutely he does. The answer is found in his encounter with a demon who came to church. Does Jesus, he speaks with authority, does he have authority even demons obey him? Oh, you better believe he's got authority, right? So that's what we're looking at right now. Verse 33, let's keep working through it and we'll be done by the time we get to verse 37. I got like some closing comments. Verse 33, in the synagogue, that's the church, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. You know what? In our world today, there's lots of people possessed by demons, right? A lot of people in our society are demonized. You wouldn't have to look very far to see that or find that. I, I, I would just suggest to you that most demons don't really manifest themselves because in our society, we've learned to treat that and to marginalize some of that. We've even turned a lot of demonic activity into entertainment. And demons love that. We live in a culture where demonic activity is, inter, is our society's entertainment. That's, that's a scary place to be. That's very, that, we're in the danger zone. That, that is, you know, and if a believer is messing around with things that are known to be demonic activity that the scripture points out, you better be very, very careful what you're messing with. You better be very careful. You're in a danger zone. I, you know, just consider this as the Holy Spirit warning you. You know, you're giving the enemy something to work with in your life, and he's not playing around. You may be playing around. You may be laughing and joking around, but they are not. They're trying to destroy you. And, 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 and you know, we see demonic activity in movies. I mean, it's everywhere in movies. I mean, I'm going to start naming movies, but, I mean, I could. But there's all kinds of, you know, in fact, there's a whole genre of movies that deal with demonic activity. There's TV shows. In fact, there's one I saw, I was scrolling through, there's one even called Lucifer. Don't watch it. You don't need to. Why would you? As a believer, why would you watch that? Why would you entertain yourself with that? I'm, you know, not trying to feel, make you feel guilty if you do, but consider it a warning from the Holy Spirit. You're in over your head with that. You don't know what you're dealing with. It's in music, it's in books, it's in video games. We have seen a dramatic escalation of demonic activity in video games and incantations and spells and, 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 and uh, what, what do they call them, potions and, and I forget what do you even call the, what you do, spells and all those things, horoscopes. Ouija boards, seances, tarot cards, palm reading, psychics. You know, you got to recognize that as demonic activity. Come on, church, wake up. That's demonic activity, you know? And in our society, we've normalized it. That's why you don't see, you know, you recognize someone who's demon-possessed or demon activity very much is because we've normalized demon activity and we downplay it. And I think for the most part, demons do not want to be exposed because that blows their cover, so they're careful. Not, you know, you know not, not, I'm not talking about pretending, you know, because kids pretend and other people pretend and there's, and there's parties where, you know, you got to dress up as a, you know, something, a Halloween or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about pretending, but I'm talking about people who actually believe they're animals or they're possessed by an animal spirit or they're guided by a spirit. It could be their, you know, great, great grandmother. It could be a former, they call it, them, themselves from the 1700s, a past life. They're, they're guiding themselves. It could be a, an animal spirit, but they actually use the word spirit. If you're not being guided by the Holy Spirit, it's a demonic spirit. That's demonic. That you, you have to see that as demonic activity. All these guides, all these spirit guides. You know what kind of spirits they are? They're evil spirits. An angel, a holy angel, will not do that. It will not guide you. That is not their function. That is why the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us. He's our guide. He's our counselor. Amen. Right? That's not the function of an angel. The demon is overstepping his bounds. 
and trying to take the place of God in your life and guide you, and he will guide you to destruction. But there was a man who was possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, <laughs> and he cried out at the top of his voice. <laughs> Don't know what that sounded like. We can imagine, and certainly if you've heard a demon, which on several occasions I've been a part, casting demons out of people, uh, once you hear it, I assure you, you can never forget it. Uh, and certainly it would have had the same effect on that synagogue in that church service as it would in this church if in this moment, because of the presence of God, a demon manifested itself and somebody possessed by a demon screamed out. Brock and I were this close, this close. During the meet and greet, we finally decided maybe we should hold off on this. When I said, what would it be like if somebody here manifested with a demon screamed out, he was going to scream out as loud as he could. <laughs> but defibrillators are very expensive and... Uh, <laughs> Man, we were that close. We might, we might, we might do that, but our, who was that? It's not April Fool's Day. It's not April Fool's Day, yeah. Maybe next year when we get to another passage, Jesus casting out demons, or we have to talk about a whole message on hell or something. We're going to make it really hot in here and turn the red lights on, but we were so close. I was 100% convinced on the idea and the concept 50-50 on the implementation, uh, implementation, but <sighs> got lucky. Uh, but when a demon is confronted with the power of God, you lucked out on that one, but when a demon is confronted with the power of God, there's a reaction to the presence of God and a demon is manifested. So they, 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 they don't want to be known, but they have to react to God's presence. They have to. They can't sit still. They can't be quiet. They cannot hide. When God's presence and, and God is near, they cannot hide. And so when they encounter the presence of God, there's a reaction. And this is a demon is seeing God incarnate. It's Jesus, the second person of the Godhead Trinity. Though he, he is here, we, we don't know when it happened in the service of the synagogue. At the synagogue, it could have been during his sermon. It could have been during the song. It could have been during the reading of the Torah. Not sure. But we know it must have happened at the time when it would have maximized the interruption because that's just the enemy, right? And I think as the presence of God here in this place builds week after week after week, it's a real possibility that there may be people that come in here to church and because we have people coming in that aren't saved and they're getting saved, praise God. But there may be someone that's going to come in and they're not going to be able to sit uh, still or quietly in service because the presence of God is strong here, and so they, uh, a couple of things are going to have to happen. Have to happen, right? The demon's not going to be comfortable with the presence of God. They're either going to have to get up and leave. We don't want them to. We want them to be delivered, right? And and if someone comes and a demon manifests, we're just we're just kind of doing some preparatory work here. Uh, don't freak out, and and don't not come back for a month or two. But know that the presence of God is here and is delivering people. And we're going to cast that demon out. And we're going to see God's authority and, and God just do things that, that are just going to blow us away in a good way. And so uh, that's awesome. So I, I'm, I'm actually excited about that uh, part of it. Not all of it, but part of it, but the deliverance part. But, but, uh, um, but there has to be a reaction to the presence of God. Everybody in this church service... This demon-possessed man all of a sudden just screams out and starts, you know, talking to Jesus, and they're like in the middle of the service. I mean, they would have froze. I mean, some of them would have been scared. Some of them, I mean, just imagine what you would have done. I mean, people are people, right? And um, look, look, look what happened, verse 34. So this demon-possessed man screams out, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? They know who he is. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. I know who you are. They know. They were there. They were there before they were cast out. They know who Jesus is. Now, no, notice what he's asking there. He says, what do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? Okay, that's what he's asking. This demon is asking Jesus. Demons have great understanding of theology. They know God. They have seen God. They were with God at one point. They understand the end times. They just don't know all the specifics. 
They know that they've been sentenced to eternal destruction. What they don't know is when. So this demon is asking Jesus, is this the time of our destruction? We know you're going to do that. Is it now? Because that tells us a lot right there, doesn't it? That tells us a lot that Jesus was, is God, that he was there at the beginning, because demons recognize that, right? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And, and we know that, that Jesus is, is more powerful than demons, right? Because they're saying, is now the time you've come to destroy it? We know you're going to do that. Is now the time? That's what they're asking. Not if, but when. Because they understand that at the end of God's plan for mankind, all demon activity will be ended. Jesus will judge sin, and Satan and the angels that followed him will be cast into the lake of fire forever. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Jesus tells us that the eternal fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. God never wanted mankind to go there. Still doesn't want mankind to go there. Hell was intended as a place for beings who are utterly wicked, and when somebody rejects God, God has provided forgiveness through Christ for them, but when somebody rejects the forgiveness, when somebody rejects God and goes into eternity, their sin remains. Sin has to be paid for, but they didn't want Jesus paying it for them, so now it has to be paid for. Now they got to pay for it themselves. They didn't have to, but their sin remains as they enter eternity, and sin must not only be paid for, it must be contained and destroyed. And so that's why when a person rejects Jesus as their Savior, they go to hell. It's their decision, not God's desire. There's nowhere else for them to go. Sin will not be allowed into heaven. That was cast out. You know, why, how can God let a sinner, you know, uh, a person go to hell? Well, how, you know, it's equally unjust for God to send a sinner to heaven. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. There's, people say, well, at least if I go to hell, there's going to be a big party. You know, like all my friends are going to be there and we're just going to have this big party. It's going to be fun and we're all together for all eternity. We're going to live it up and they have ideas of what that party looks like. And, but no, hell is a place of outer darkness, Jesus says. That means it's you in the darkness, alone, suffering in unbelievable torment more than these bodies could ever know, these earthly bodies, and at the same time, surrounded by beings that are utterly evil. I, I mean, you don't want to go there. Revelation chapter 20. I, I want you to see what this demon is fearing. I want you to see what this demon is afraid of. Because the de this demon understands the end. So, Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse uh, 15. Or starting in verse 10. I'll go through verse 15. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur... That doesn't sound like a party. Where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, you want to know more about who they are? Well, back it up a couple chapters. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And this is, this is for unbelievers, okay? And another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's for believers, but now back to unbelievers. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. This is for unbelievers. Because now, now all that was paid for, but you didn't receive that, so now we got to go through the books. Now we, everything was recorded. So now we're, there will not be one person in hell that does not know why they're there. They will know exactly the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. How awful is this place, just mentioned as the lake of fire, how awful is that if even hell is thrown into it? Death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire, the lake of fire is the second death. Verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That is what this demon is fearing, knows is coming, and is saying, Jesus, is it now? He knows, he knows the what, he just doesn't know the when. 
Where are we? So the demon, you know, he, when he says to Jesus, he understands the end time events. He understands the Messiah is going to bring that about eventually. He's just asking, are you going to do that now? Is this the time that's going to happen? You say, well, if they know that that's going to happen, how come they still fight God? How come they keep fighting God if they know that's going to happen? Great question. Well, we have to understand they hope to thwart the plan of God. They hope to somehow thwart that. Secondarily, they're wicked by nature. That's who they are in the core now. And, and so all they can do is wickedness. There's not one ounce of righteousness in them or to do right in them. Third, they hate God as much as it is possible to hate God. And so they fight God by trying to take out as many people as they can because they know God loves people. They can't hurt God directly, so they're going to try to hurt God indirectly. And fourth, they're spiritual beings, and as a result of that, they never get tired, so energy is not a problem, so they fight. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Verse 35, be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Be quiet. Jesus is not going to argue with a demon. Be quiet, come out of him. That's all he says. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Tried to, but didn't. The demon challenges Jesus, but Jesus' authority is obvious, and the demon flees. And the crowd's response, seeing the authority of Christ Jesus, are in a state of awe because they now know he has authority, so what he spoke is the authority. His authority is true. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching with authority and power? Jesus gives orders and even evil spirits obey him and they flee at his command. I mean, it blew their mind. They had never seen anything like this. There was no like razzmatazz, right? There was no show. There was no elongated battle. You know, it wasn't back and forth. Who's going to win? There's no incantations, no formulas, none of that. The demon recognizes Jesus, knows who he is, and Jesus says, shut up and get out, and that's it. Wow. Verse 37, and news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. And I'm saying, church, let's get the news out there, right? Let's get the news out there. You can start some music as we go here to point two. It's only going to take one minute. We looked at the authority of Jesus. Number two, the saving power of Jesus Christ. The saving power of Jesus Christ. The authority, and now the saving power of Jesus Christ. We, we receive confidence From the realization that powerful though Satan and his accomplices are, there are definite limits to what they can do. God is restraining evil and limiting it until his plan is fulfilled, and then he will judge evil. So we can, by the grace of God, resist the devil successfully in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we can know his ultimate defeat is certain. Amen? Amen. There is a real devil. There are real demons, and they have influence. But there's a real son of God, and his name is Jesus. And he has unlimited power, and he has unlimited authority. And he's come to set us free. And he whom the Son of God sets free is free indeed. And you can be sure he has the authority to declare truth, which means the truth that he is the only way to be saved. When Jesus says, this is what is, that is what is. John chapter 14, verse 6, what does Jesus, who has authority and speaks with authority, say? He says, I am the way. In the Greek, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I I am the only life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't get to heaven except through me. You can't come to God, know God, be in eternity with God except through me, Jesus says. You better be able, you, we take that to the bank. It's true. Jesus speaks with authority. What he says is, and we know he has authority because even the devil and demons flee at his command. Romans 10, 13 Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. He wants to save you, but you have a choice. We talked about it last week, the great decision. It is your choice. You are a a free moral agent, meaning he gave you free will. You have a choice, and he lays it out there, and the Holy Spirit draws, and he pleads with you, 
please, 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 please don't let the books be opened on you. He, Jesus has authority to deliver from demons. He has authority to declare the truth and he has the power to save us from hell. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, we come to you.